Yes, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The pro the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round. Wherever folks are found, that the Comforter has come. Yes, the Comforter has come, and the Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven, the promise, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round Wherever men are found That the Comforter has come Well, I've got peace like a river I've got peace like a river I've got peace like a river in my soul and i've got peace like a river and i've got peace like a river i've got peace like a river in my soul i've got joy like a fountain i've got joy like a fountain and i've got joy like a fountain I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. Well, I've got joy like a fountain, and I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. Got love like an ocean, and I've got love like an ocean, and I've got love like an ocean i've got love like an ocean in my soul and i've got love like an ocean and i've got love like an ocean i've got love like an ocean in my soul I'm gonna sing that i've got peace like a river again as far as I know, there's a lot about peace in the scripture, some great words from Jesus about peace. But the place that I am remember in my mind where it talks about uh, peace like a river is in Isaiah, where it's almost like God was lamenting about how his people had turned away from him. And he said, oh, if only you had kept my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river. Well, wow. you know, Anything that God tells us to do, it's for our good so that we can have the best and the most out of life. And God says, oh, if you'll only follow me, if you'll follow my leading, follow my guidance, you're, you, you, you will have the best that you can have in this world as far as, as, as life itself. Your peace would be like a river. I'll sing that again. And I believe if we're following him fully tonight, and our trust is completely in Him. To the best of our ability, we can have that peace like a river. Well, I've got peace like a river, and I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. Well, I've got like a river and I've got peace like a river I've got peace like a river in my soul did you are you gonna read some scriptures uh, soon from I am great hold it to like stop the air conditioner the Word of God we are not to live. We, we cannot live by bread alone, but by every word Jesus said that proceeds from the mouth of God. May His word be our life. 
That air conditioning should stop in a minute. We're going to have to figure out how to deal with the air since the intake, the intake uh, element is here in the in the cockpit. Mm. Peace. It's interesting, Eddie. That I. That was one of the topics I felt really? to read about. So don't so don't don't put your guitar too um, far no, away. I'm no, it's right here. Yeah. The Lord will give strength to His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. Mm. Psalm twenty nine eleven. Remember, this is out of Valerie Owen's compilation of scriptures. She calls it "Healing in the Wings." It's been a blessing to so many people for so many years. Let me see. You can find this online at Amazon in uh, ebook format, or you could uh, look up Valerie Owen at yahoo.com and see if she has any that she could sell you. I don't see a date on this, but I know it was back in the 90s that this was. She had this compiled. Okay, Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have those who love. God's law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Proverbs 3, 2, For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. That is God's word. Will add mm. length of days and long life and peace. God's word will add. Amen. So you're communicating there with folks, are you, Eddie? Yeah, I just went over to Facebook while you're reading there. So. Okay, Freddie Hall joined. You know, for the first few minutes, we uh, we just share and interact and uh, share scriptures spontaneously. And uh, at about quarter to the hour, we like to share updates on the Hall of Fame and on uh, just other bit, tidbits of news. But if you have any prayer requests too, please feel free to... Uh, Post them either at uh, li uh, Facebook Live or at the live stream address, whichever one you're you are using. Isaiah twenty six three, Eddie, is this the one perhaps that you were quoting? I I wasn't sure, but you mm -hmm. will. God will keep the person in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on Him, because that person trusts in God. Right. Mm. Isaiah 26, 3, God will keep that person in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him yeah. because that person trusts in God. Isaiah 55, 12, for you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. Joy and peace. After all these years of living, I, I think I understand that what people want most is just peace. Peace. And God promises peace, and these are His promises of peace from His Word. Isaiah 57, 2. The, the man or woman, boy or girl, shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in uprightness. Isaiah 57, 19. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to the one who is far off and to the one who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal that person. John fourteen twenty seven. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's a command. That's not an, just a, a suggestion. That's a command. Eddie, I'm just wondering, are you checking in on... Um, I see you're on Facebook, but are you checking in on live stream? Because a number of our friends go there. So it might be better if you were at live stream because I have Facebook covered here. Oh, do you? Okay, yes. good. Okay, that's good. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think probably it'd be good if you were at Facebook. Okay. All right. Isaiah 54 10 says nor shall my covenant of peace be removed says the Lord in other words he gives peace and that's it period it's to stay and what it took to bring peace was upon him it's not our making it's something we receive and facilitate into our lives he's the one that created peace he's the one who gives peace our job is to receive it according to Isaiah 53 5 then John 16:33 These things I have spoken to you Jesus said that in 
me you may have peace. Romans 1 7 grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 1 therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8 6 Oh, let's just go back to Romans 5, 1 for a minute, Eddie. Okay. But peace doesn't come by contemplative prayer. A certain kind of settledness can come through these religious soul realm activities. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that peace comes through the Lord Jesus Christ right. and through His Word. Um, it's not something that we conjure up by certain religious uh, postures and activities. It's something that we receive because Jesus has made it possible. He, true. And we, yeah, simply, true. we simply facilitate that. We choose peace. So, are you with me there? Hey, is there anyone on face? Anyone uh, Valerie on? is on. Valerie hey, Valerie. Came on. Wish you were here, Valerie, and that you were reading these. But that's okay. We'll let it go this week. <laughs> Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Not we might get it, but having been justified mm. by faith, we have it. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great promise. See, every word counts there. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 6, this is a good one, Eddie, and I've heard you, well, it's been many years now, but I heard you uh, teach an incredible uh, message on this one. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Mm. To be carnally minded is? Is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wow. Maybe sometime you need to teach that. Mm. Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Kingdom of God isn't, isn't a government, Eddie, is it? No, it's, 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 God's, it's God's government expressed in us and through us. What do you mean, us. God's government? Well, God wants to guide our lives. He wants to govern our lives. Uh, and so He does it by His Word and His Spirit. And yes, we are to learn from others and so on, but it's, it's not an outward kingdom at this time. It will be one day, but at this time, Jesus made it very clear when he was standing before Pilate and uh, Pilate asked him if he was a king and he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, but now my kingdom is not from, from here. But some folks today would would uh, transfer this idea of the kingdom into a certain structure within a church, right? right a, a certain outward organizational structure. But that's not in and, the Bible and, and anywhere. And you've got to conform to that structure and to that. And align with it. There's the big word right, these days. Yeah. We have to, mm -hmm. but that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, you have a little book called Pursuing Power. Are you with oh, me? Right, right. Are you with me tonight? I'm with you, but I, I I couldn't think of a name of a book related to the kingdom of God. So yeah, pursuing power. Tell is, us about uh, it, tell it, us it about is, pursuing uh, power. Al although, see, the, I, I don't even talk about the kingdom of God in it. So that's why I had a hard time making the connection. But oh, uh, Eddie, Eddie, yeah. stop making excuses. <laughs> <laughs> Go but for it. it's about. It is about. What you were talking about, the uh, organizational structures. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a church history, Sue. It tells about how the present organizational, institutional forms of Christianity formed out, out of the first century. Tells about the formation of Roman Catholicism. Tells about the formation of Eastern Orthodoxy. Tells about the formation of Protestantism. And... Uh, it, and the point in it all is, is that so many of these organizations have formed out of power struggles and people who are pursuing power. And um, it, it is, it is a, a powerful book. And I have had, so I have had uh, not too long ago, I, I was told, uh, I was informed by a person who is with the Foursquare Church that he had given 
the book to some officials in the Foursquare Church, and one of them was taking it to South America because he said it was exactly what they needed to deal with, uh, uh, the new apostolic reformation that was making headway in their churches in uh, South America, which teaches an outward present kingdom. And uh, so anyway, he said that the book was just exactly what he needed to address that problem with their churches in South America. So anyway, there, there's been a lot of response to that book in that regard. So anyway, if you want to know about the cause of so many denominations in the world today, one of the major, probably I would say the major cause, I won't say the only cause, but the major cause of so many denominations in the world today, get this book, Pursuing Power. By Eddie Hyatt. That's right. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Eddie, you had a meeting here last night in the mm -hmm. studio. Yeah. Um, normally, you have it in the clubhouse mm -hmm. here at the resort at 925 on yeah. Main Street in Grapevine, but you had it here last night. True. And uh, you, you're teaching on the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Teaching and, through and that's the going book to be of an Acts tonight with Lucy Farrow. That's going to be an emphasis tonight. Well, too. tell us about tell us uh, last night. What what were you teaching about the Holy Spirit well, last know, night? If I tell you right now, it's going to be saying what I am going to say when I introduce Lucy Farrow tonight. Okay. So, um, so let's keep reading. <laughs> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Hmm. Ephesians 1, 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Essentially, Eddie, that's saying, are you with me here? Yep. That's just saying that there is no more class structure, there is no more distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, the ground is level at the cross, right. and it's all because of Jesus and what he True. has done yep. to bring us all to that place in him. Yep. He's not, he doesn't favor some more than others. He himself is our peace, he's the converging point. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Now that, that's, that's a, an interesting one for guidance. I've heard you quote, I don't know if it's the Amplified Bible about that, let the peace of God rule in your heart, or maybe it was the Living Bible. The Living Bible, Ken Taylor paraphrased that uh, this way. He said, uh, let the peace of God be the umpire in your heart, calling the close ones. You know, and that's important because Satan does not have any peace. Anywhere there are Satan and demons, there, there's upset, there's turmoil. And so one way we can know, discern, as it says there, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the peace of God be the, uh, be the umpire. Let the peace of God guide you. And I know, Sue, you and I both experienced this. When we first walked into this place, there was a sense of peace, right? Right. There was just a, an eternal sense of peace. And so that is one factor in discerning God's guidance and God's direction. Follow the peace. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. And if there isn't peace, then, then what? What do you do? Well, you, you need to stand still. Pray, ask God to give you further direction. I like to say, think with God. Mm -hmm. Ask Him questions. He loves to talk to us. Yeah. He loves to hear us talk to Him. Not just asking for things, but just saying, God, what about this? Or, you know, God, I, I don't seem to have peace right now. What What's the mm -hmm. problem here? Yeah. When, when I'm in one room working and you're in another room working and uh, I'll be working along, you know, everything's going fine. All of a sudden, I am... I don't have peace. I'm distracted. And when, what is it that I say? Are you okay? <laughs> Eddie, are you okay? <laughs> Meaning, hey, you know, I've checked myself out. I've, peace has been, there's a little bit of uh, disruption, static. And it and might just be that my, um, uh, that I lost something I was writing and I can't find it. And, um, 
and so on. It may just be something, something minor like that. So I check and I say, now, I check myself first. I don't go to you and nag you. I say, God, what, why don't I have peace? Is there some place that I'm off track in terms of my priorities, in terms of what I'm doing and, and what I, or what I ought to be doing instead? Or, you know, is there something that you want to say to me? Where's, why am I feeling some static? Why am I experiencing static and not peace? You see, we have a responsibility. It's not just the privilege of peace, it's the responsibility that we have to let peace rule and reign in our hearts. And so, having checked myself out, I then say, Eddie, Eddie, you okay? What you doing, Eddie? <laughs> Sometimes you get tired of my saying that or asking you that, but very often it just helps you to evaluate where you are mm. and get back on track. And then you'll say, hey, Sue, how are you now? Everything okay? I, <laughs> I made some changes. Or, you know what, Sue, I think I was just tired and I was pushing too hard to get this work done. Mm. And I just, I, I, I changed gears, I stopped. And, but and you, it's you, interesting, you there's peace. You are like that to pick up. But don't you think, you. But, but that's not just me, is it? Don't you think that we're all, to, we're to, all to gifted another, yes. yep. to, to, be, to walk after the Spirit? Is it not to mm -hmm. be aware of what the Spirit is experiencing? Isn't that, isn't that it? That's isn't that to be spiritually absolutely. minded? Is life and peace? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I, I think that I'll pause it's almost quarter well, well, two. Well, let's, uh, Mildred uh, Young uh, had posted asking prayer for Jean Sparks and their family. Her husband, Rodney Sparks, passed away on Sunday. Rodney and I were in the same graduating class in Shakota, Texas in 1965. So these are people I've known since we were kids. And so maybe we could just pause and we'll pray for Jean, pray for their children, pray for the family. Uh, and, and they are having a gathering tonight at the funeral uh, home for friends and family there in Paris, Texas. And so that means that a number of our friends who are normally on at this time are actually at the funeral home. Right, right. Uh, Delilah, Charles and Delilah mm -hmm. checked in right. and uh, said that they'd be late coming on. But the exciting thing about live stream, Eddie, is that it's there whenever people are, mm -hmm. are able right. to be there. Yep. It's so flexible. It's yeah. so wonderful. And uh, Carmel in Athlone, instead of staying up half of the night to be with us, now she does it. She, she tunes in first thing in the morning when she wakes up. And I believe Margaret O'Healy uh, tends to do that too because mm. I think Margaret and Sean have a, a home meeting on Tuesdays. Oh, okay. Um, and so then they pick this up on be Wednesday morning their okay. time. Yeah. So so uh, these prayers, even though we're praying now at this time at 643 on Tuesday here in Dallas, mm. these folks are going to be praying for Jean and the family. Yeah. So it's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. You know, Eddie, yeah. when we, uh, when we uh, started uh, video and satellite Bible schools through Word of Faith back in 19, was it 1990? Um, or 91, 89? Well, we, we, we started the video in... In 79. Uh, probably, uh, it was the early... It would have been uh, about 1980. 1980, right. 1980. Um, <laughs> you remember how there would be... The, some Say Valerie would be teaching or Bill Kaiser would be teaching and there'd be such the a manifest presence of God in our in our class there in St. John. Um, yeah, the anointing is preserved and, and communicated through, you know, the recordings. That's what I'm getting to, trying yeah. to say here. Absolutely, so nothing is lost. So yeah. let's pray for Jean and her family. Yes, Father, thank you. Lord, I thank you that Rodney was a follower of you. And so we can be assured, his family can be assured that he is with you because he had put his trust in Jesus. And Lord, even, so Lord, tonight we pray for Gene and his children and all of the family. Father, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for your supernatural peace, that peace that we sang about, that peace that Sue read about. We pray for that supernatural peace from heaven 
to be in their hearts tonight, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray, and we give you all of the praise. We give you all of the glory and the honor for it all, and we thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. And Sue, there's a, a pat, one of my favorite, maybe my all-time favorite passage on peace, although they're all good. Hey, Richard. Richard Stewart, I've been wondering where you are. And there you are back. And Steve Arbo up in uh, New Hampshire says, I agree in Jesus' name for peace for all of them. And our, my longtime um, second cousin and friend, Carol Shipley, is, is on. Um, so it's exciting. Your second cousin? She's she, uh, through the Holder family oh, in okay, Holderville. Okay. I didn't know Her mother it, was a Holder and my grandmother was a Holder. Or, yeah. And so we're related. I don't okay. know what a second cousin is. It's, you know, right. how it but goes. But the passage I was going to quote, Sue, is uh, the words of Jesus in John 14, where he said, uh, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. The supernatural peace of Jesus seated at this moment at the right hand of God with all power in heaven and in earth. He's not nervous. He's not wringing his hands. He is called the Prince of Peace. And before he left, he said, my peace I leave with you. Which, and and the, the word is, is the word that is used when somebody would, would, would bequeath an inheritance to their, to their posterity, to their children. And Jesus is saying, I'm leaving you my peace. <laughs> That's your inheritance. I'm leaving you. Peace I leave with you. What kind of peace? It's not a separate peace from himself. It's his own peace. My peace I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So, boy, I just believe tonight as... Those of you maybe who are troubled, maybe you maybe even experience a demonic attack of oppression against you. Well, we break it in the name of Jesus and we declare your inheritance. Jesus left you an inheritance of peace and it's his own peace that he has left with you as his child. So in the name of Jesus, we declare the peace of God Throughout this stream, everywhere it goes, may it flow like a river throughout this stream and bring supernatural peace into hearts and minds everywhere. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. I turn my mic off when the air conditioning is working uh, to keep the noise factor down, but I'm going to have to go ahead and, and deal with it here. Um, I, want to, I want to go ahead and do some announcements okay, for so. those of you who are perhaps new. Oh, let me try this again. G1. Welcome to God's Word to the World Fellowship and College. Uh, we are your hosts, Eddie and Sue Hyatt. Tonight, the lesson, the, the study will be the life of Lucy Far Farrow. Um, she was a black woman whom God used to ignite a very powerful, world-changing revival. Um, we have four purposes here. The first is to bring peace, hope, and healing through God, biblical thinking and spiritual awakening. Purpose number two is to provide a safe place of fellowship, sound teaching, prayer, and praise. Purpose number three is to teach all that Jesus commanded, as he said in the Great Commission. And purpose number four, to teach the truth about biblical manhood and womanhood and biblical relationships. And the truth that has been lost except during times of outpour the outpouring of the Spirit in history, but that Jesus taught and the Bible teaches accurately interpreted is this. The Bible teaches the equality of women and men in terms of substance and value, privilege and responsibility, function and authority in all areas of life and leadership, ministry and marriage. Shared responsibility. Now here are some announcements. Um, most of you who are on know that our current major step of faith is 
the International Christian Women's Hall of Fame Research and Ministry Center. Its purpose, celebrating God's women of yesterday and today and creating world changers for a better tomorrow. This is a, a, something that God dropped into my heart 19 plus years ago. And in the past few months, we've been seeing this come to fruition. Here's a, a report for friends and partners today. We've been working on the gallery. Now here's a shot of the tea room here to my right. Uh, we're setting up the coffee maker and the teapot and all the goodies. It's not quite ship shape. We've got some lovely pictures to put on the walls and, and uh, just need to believe for some nice comfortable chairs there. This is the beginning of the gallery. This is all raw material. You'll see in the center uh, back is a uh, painting that Ildi uh, Pergi, I know that's not the way you, you pronounce the Hungarian name, forgive me Ildi if you're on, she painted a number of portraits of women from history, women who tend to have been left out. Now this is a, a portrait of Pandita Ramabi and the incredible thing about Pandita Ramabi, Ramabi is that she was called, she was named by the Indian government the woman of the year. India, the government, named a Christian woman, the woman of the millennium. She needs to be, we need to learn from her. And next to her, uh, in this picture, you'll see a little red vinyl um, record. Uh, it's a Christine Gibson, who founded Zion Bible Institute. In, in the 1920s and this she she had a vision and she's talking in on this message about tarry till the the, the the vision will come to pass tarry till it comes to pass and then in front of that you'll see a little book written by uh, my friend Pat Pickard in Bangor Maine uh, she d tells the story of sister Christine Gibson I'm eager to be able to share her life. We, I did get a, a little record player from uh, Kohl's for $49 so that we can, so that people who can, who come into the hall will be able to actually hear Christine Gibson. So if you would like to pay for that or help to pay for that uh, record player, $49, amen. Um, and then here's more raw material. You'll see there on the left, that's the, the that's the stuff that will become a glass exhibit case. And then to the right, you'll see the raw material for the Catherine Bushnell and God's Word to Women exhibit. Um, okay, and then here, where are my Susannas, my Phoebes, my Amys? That's the raw material for the exhibit. Lots of raw material. I mean, it is work time here. And Eddie, this past week, we did some picking, didn't we? We did. What uh, did we do? Well, uh, the owner invited us, he said he had a, uh, he called it a warehouse where he had some uh, furniture stored and he invited us to go look and if there was anything we wanted to, to borrow, he welcomed us to do so. So we did borrow four white chairs like that. And three other chairs, and nice three, three leather chairs, chairs, plus a number of beautiful frames and framed paintings. Uh, and some some uh, other decor, so it was it so was so, fun. So God is providing. God is providing. You know, it's amazing. I'm just sitting here going through that. The forty thousand dollar renovations is all paid. Um, the bills are current right now, and uh, so so we are just in awe of 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 how God has brought us to this point. Now there's a new month coming up with rent, utilities for the first time are going on so everybody just stay in faith with us and we're believing that God is opening the wind will continue to open the windows of heaven and soon there will be no lack and I, I know Eddie I believe that um, but to let people know it's through the faithful giving and the prayers of partners and friends that all of this is able to happen so to make a one-time gift or to become a monthly partner, here's where you can go. Click and it'll give you the information. GWTW, Christian Women's Hall of Fame.com. 
there it is. So uh, we need, I need personally, I need to see more monthly partners. I need to know that we, we're a, going to be able to sustain this and you will be blessed. Oh, I see Laura Updegrove just came on, Eddie. There's, yes. an, there's a note from her yeah, there I, I see in that. Arkansas. You know, That's so good. I'm just going to say this. And, um, you know, I, I, I never want to tie people giving money to be blessed. You'll be blessed if you walk with God and you serve Him. Your blessing is never tied to sending somebody an offering, including us. Unless, of course, God God speak to you. Speak the blessing to you about of obedience is, is, is obedience. important. Yes, but I do want to say this. So, uh, you know, you know, the own ministry that I do, going out, teaching, preaching, writing, publishing. I made a commitment that I was going to tithe to the to the Hall of Fame out of money that comes into eight Hyde International Ministries through my own preaching and speaking. And I have seen some unusual opportunities and open doors. Uh, book purchases <laughs> and things happen just in the last few months since that happened. Now, I, I take that, you know, however you want to take that, but I have seen, well, you, and you, you can testify to that, can't you? Yes, I can. Uh, some unusual opportunities have presented themselves that I would never have guessed. And uh, so anyway, if God leads you to be a part of this, I know that God's blessing is on this International Christian Women's Hall of Fame. And Ministry Center. And, and Ministry Center. And God is going to use it. Is using it. And is using it and will use it in the days ahead to impact the world and to change the way the church and the world thinks about men and women in the body of Christ. And so, so we, ha we have a mandate from God and I know that God's blessing is on what we're doing. And thank you all for being a part of this. And Shirley Hall White is on in New Zealand and hey, she Shirley. says hello everybody, love to all and love back to you. And uh, let's see, Priscilla Gale Valle, Valle, Priscilla forgive me for not knowing exactly how to pronounce your last name, V-A-L-L-E-S, and Vel Bigay or B-J. Vel, you were on last week and uh, let us know uh, you know, send a message or, or whatever. Uh, let us know who you are. It says, enter your password for your... Why is it doing that all of a sudden? I don't know. I've lost connection on my iPad. Okay, I won't bother with that right now. Okay, and so, back to this, Eddie. We're almost to the top of the hour. Yeah. Um, some of you may not know that you can support God's Word to, the, to women by shopping at Amazon Smile. Whenever you sign up at, uh, at Amazon, if you purchase things on Amazon, uh, go to Amazon Smile and make God's Word to women your, uh, your charity. And they will send a portion of, of your purchase price to, to God's Word to women, and it will go into helping to sustain the International Christian Women's Hall of Fame. It's not just a matter of sustenance right now, is it? It's a matter of there's so much that is needed to create the gallery. We're still working on the studio. It's still a bit rough. It'll, it'll continue to improve. It just takes time and, and the investments needed. But the gallery is where we're investing now. And uh, believe me, it's taking, taking a bunch. Okay, so then uh, if you want one of, the, uh, one of the flyers, let me know. I can email that to you. And uh, Eddie is doing, uh, as you probably know if you've been on much, you know that he does two outreaches in the Metroplex, one here at 925, uh, 920, the resort at 925 in Grapevine, and this week and next week he'll be holding that Bible study in the hall right here in the studio. Um, no, he's doing the Acts of the Holy Spirit today, a study in the book of Acts, and last night was, was so blessed. Uh, then he's continuing. There are hungry people over there at uh, Las Colinas, Eddie, at the, mm -hmm. yes. the resorts at Jefferson Ridge mm -hmm. and Jefferson Park. Yep. Uh, that's on Thursday night, so please feel free to join him. 
and, okay. and, and this weekend, Sue, I'm going to be up in the, uh, Paris and Reno, and I'll be uh, with uh, Charles and Lala Hicks Saturday afternoon at 4 p.m. So everybody there in that area, come on out. If you, if you play a musical instrument, bring it. We'll have a great time of fellowship, worshiping God. I'll share what I believe will be an appropriate, timely word. And then Sunday night, I'm going to be at Lifeline Worship Center with uh, Larry, Stacy Young, Mildred Young. Have you so confirmed that? I have, yes. Oh, great. And, and so come out Sunday night, I believe it's 6 p.m. in Reno at Lifeline Worship Center. So looking forward to a great weekend. Uh, and if, in a few days, Eddie, we're leaving for Virginia Beach, Virginia, where you'll be ministering on July the 2nd at the Rock Church. Yeah, that, that's one of those opportunities that just opened up that uh, totally unexpected. And uh, so, yeah, I, they have asked me to come to uh, related to the 4th of July and do a presentation based on my book, uh, Pilgrims and Patriots. And I have put together a slide presentation that I call reclaiming the original American vision and it is very powerful and interestingly Christ for the Nations has asked me to come and do the same thing for three days uh, Wednesday through Friday uh, and I think it's at the uh, the first week of the beginning of the semester uh, the fall semester I'll be presenting the same thing as the guest teacher there that week too and uh, so anyway, this is a very powerful thing. Thank, thank you for your prayers because... And you are available. You hey, are hey, available. I am available, yes. Yes. If, any, if, if anybody would like to invite me to come and speak, hey, I am available. Now on Friday, Eddie, I have an exciting uh, visit from two key people from the Alumni Association at uh, Regent University. In Virginia Beach, yeah. They're coming here for the annual alumni banquet here that's held every year here in Grapevine. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've asked if they could come to see what we're doing here at the International Christian Women's Hall of Fame on Friday afternoon. Great. And so uh, I just, uh, I don't want them to be disappointed. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I've tried to tell them it's, it's humble beginnings, but hey, it is be a beginning and I am proud of what God is yes, doing. Yeah, it's good, so, so that's going to be good. And then Saturday, while you're in Paris, I am, someone has paid my way to go to this Regent University alumni banquet. We graduated in, with our doctorates from Regent in the year 2000. And so uh, we haven't been really involved in alumni associations, but it's such a blessing that people oh, are... Oh, so is your sound on? Do you have your mic on? Yes. Okay, Martin in, uh, up in um, Cape Breton just said, is it me or is there no sound? Uh, Martin, are you hearing it now? Okay, Eddie, it's time for Lucy. It's the top of the hour. All so right. why don't you go ahead and dig in there, boy? Okay, let's... Uh, the, the scripture, you know, before we do that, I, I want to sing a song we were singing earlier related to the, the scriptures that you read, Sue. Lucy Farrell's life is about the Holy Spirit, about the, the, the baptism, the power of the Holy Spirit. And that piece that Sue was reading about, it only comes from the Holy Spirit. You, you can't have that, uh, that peace, that joy that Peter said defies or it's... Uh, Joy unspeakable, full of glory. Apart from, from, from heaven, apart from the Holy Spirit. So I was singing this earlier and I, I, just, uh, I just want to sing it again before we start. It says, I've got peace. Sing with me if you know it. I've got peace like a river and I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul and i've got peace like a river and i've got peace like a river i've got peace like a river in my soul amen 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 and you can have that peace like a river in the midst of the most trying situations because it doesn't come from your outward circumstances and situations it comes from heaven it comes from the indwelling from the inside 
from the indwelling Holy Spirit. You know, this woman we're going to talk about tonight, Lucy Farrell, she, uh, she, a black woman born in slavery, she was really the one who ignited the great Azusa Street revival in Los Angeles. I know that William Seymour is normally given all of the credit for the revival and so on, and, and, and very deservingly so, he is given credit because he was very prominent there and, and the recognized leader. But what I'm going to show you tonight, no, there was no outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There was nobody baptized in the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit did not begin to flow until this woman, Lucy Farrell, came there and began laying hands on people. Now, for some reason, my phone is ringing, so I'm going to turn the sound off so that I don't... Uh, experience uh, that kind of interruption. Nobody was baptized in the Holy Spirit. There was not an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There was not a release of gifts of the Holy Spirit until Lucy Farrell came to Los Angeles and began laying her hands on people and, 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 and in a remarkable ways the Spirit of God began to be poured out and we'll talk about that in detail and, and, and give you some of the quotes and examples of what happened. And your faith is going to be inspired tonight that God can use you. Yes, God can use you to ignite revival. Lucy Farrell's life was about the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to read a passage from Luke chapter 1 beginning at verse 4. And Luke is telling about so, uh, some of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus during the 40 days between His resurrection and, in his, and his ascension. During that 40-day period, He made various appearances to different disciples. And in verse 4 of chapter 1 of Acts, Luke says, And being assembled together with them, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. And what I want you to see here is, and Lucy Farrell knew this, was that the Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. The Holy Spirit does not discriminate on the basis of one's sex, on the basis of whether one is a man or a woman. The Holy Spirit does not discriminate when He distributes His gifts and callings. Now this promise of the Father, verse 4, Jesus said to them, to the disciples, he, before, just before He ascended to heaven, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. What is the promise of the Father? Well, Jesus explains. He says, which you have heard from me. In other words, I have talked to you about this. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So here Jesus makes a contrast between, between John's baptism in water and a baptism in the Holy Spirit. By the way, the word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to immerse, to cover, and to soak. And Jesus said, John truly immersed and soaked and covered in water, but you will be baptized, immersed, and soaked in the Holy Spirit. Well, John the Baptist said the very same thing. Before he ever met Jesus, he was preaching. And he said one day, I truly baptizo, I baptize you, I soak you in water. But there is one coming after me who is so majestic and so great, I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. Carrying a, a master's sandals was the job of, a, of the lowliest of servants. John the Baptist says, He is so great, I am not even worthy to carry his sandals. And he shall baptize you. He shall soak you and cover you with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And with fire. Wow. One day Jesus came down to where John was preaching and baptizing. And Jesus came to John to be baptized by him. And remember, John has had the revelation of the coming Messiah. That he has a baptism, but it is going to be a baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And when John came 
When Jesus came to John to be baptized, John said to him, Are you coming to me to be baptized? I need to be baptized by you. Now, I don't believe he was talking about Jesus baptizing him in water. No, because John has had the revelation of this coming one whose baptism would be a baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And what John the Baptist is saying, you're coming to me to be baptized? Jesus, I need your baptism. I've had this revelation that you are the coming one who will baptize, who will bring a baptism, a soaking with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And Jesus, I need your baptism. <laughs> oh, my friends, that's what the church needs today. A fresh baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus then goes on, and they ask him in verse 7, they ask him an end times prophecy question. It is not for you to know the times or seas uh, about, are, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, well, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the fathers put in his own authority. Verse 8, but you shall receive dunamis, Greek word dunamis, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In other words, when you are baptized, when you're covered and soaked with the Holy Spirit, at that moment you will receive power. And what is the purpose of this power? To give us goosebumps on top of goosebumps? To give us cold chills on top of cold chills? To make us, to give us the, the greatest high we have ever had? No. Now, don't get me wrong. There are incredible experiences when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. There are ecstasies of joy and peace and wondrous things, wondrous experiences. But that is not the purpose. Always be careful of a spirituality that is turned inward, that encourages you to pursue another bigger and greater experience. Be careful of that kind of spirituality that is turned inward and self-seeking. The spirituality of the New Testament and the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about is turned outward, empowering us to go out and engage this world by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus said, when, when you, re, when, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you won't withdraw into a convent or to a monastery and sit in a lotus position and hum and make harmonious sounds and try to have another experience. No, you will go out into the world and you will prophetically engage the world and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And verse 14 says, well, verse, look at verse 12, 13, 14. Yes, I'm going to get to Lucy Fair in just a moment, but this is so important to lay a groundwork of what she was about. Then they, that's all the disciples, and there's a bunch of them. There's 120 of them. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. And then it lists the 11 disciples minus Judas. And it says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplications with the women. Who are the women? These are the many women of Galilee who had left everything to follow Jesus and followed him on that journey, probably of several weeks, that journey to, to Jerusalem. And there were other women who joined along the way and women in Jerusalem. And these are the women who were there at the cross when he was crucified. These are the women that, that observed where his body were, was laid. These are the women who were the first ones there on resurrection morning. And now they are there together in the upper room with the, with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, his Adelphoi, his brothers and sisters. These would be the children of Mary and Joseph. Now, 
So, there is no indication that in the upper room there was any segregation. The men were not on one side and the women on the other. Every indication is they were all there together in one accord. There was an internal unity and harmony. And then verse chapter 2, when uh, it tells about when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they who, these 120 women and men, I suspect that the women outnumbered the men because in Luke chapter 8, Luke, who is writing this in his gospel, he referred to certain women by, by name who were following Jesus and then he used the word he said, and many others, many other women who were following Jesus. I have a feeling that in the upper room, the, the women outnumbered the men. And what happened? They were all together in one place in one accord and suddenly there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divi divided tongues as of fire and one set upon each of them. All of them, the men, the women. There was no discrimination based on one sex. The men and the women all, they had these tongues of fire that sat upon their heads, which was a picture of the fire, the passion of the Holy Spirit that is now going to empower them to go forth and to speak and to, to be witnesses of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And verse 4 says, Then they were all, how many? All, all 120 of them, not just the men, the men and the women, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. For what purpose? So that they would all be witnesses of to Jesus. So that they could all proclaim, preach, and teach the message of Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the, the earth. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one set up on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. Church doctrine and tradition discriminates, but when the Holy Spirit is given free reign, He is the great equalizer. And He filled all of them on the day of Pentecost. And this is the pattern that God wants us to follow today for that we are open to the Holy Spirit coming upon and God using any one of us in our midst, whether a man or a woman, whether black or white or brown or red or whatever. And this is what we see in the life of Lucy Farrell. Very little is known of Lucy Farrell's early life, except the fact she was born in Norfolk, Virginia, probably in the year 1851. She actually was born into slavery. Her parents were slaves. And so as a black woman living in the South during Reconstruction, Reconstruction was uh, because the South was so destroyed, there was a, a attempts after the war was over to, to, to bring Reconstruction and so on. And, uh, but also there were these attempts to preserve the Southern way of life. And so there was much discrimination and hostility uh, during these years. And so as a black woman living in the South during Reconstruction, life would not have been easy. But in spite of being continually confronted with prejudice and injustice, she became a powerful voice in the early Pentecostal revival and she provided the spark in Los Angeles that ignited the revival that has spread around the world and today has impacted all of Christendom around the world. She Eddie. is an example of how one can become a force for God and good even in the most difficult and aggravating circumstances. She is an example of how you don't have to become a victim in life. You can be a victor regardless of where you were born, regardless of the circumstances in which you grew up. You don't have to be a victim. You can be a victor through Jesus Christ, whom, whom Paul said has made us more than conquerors. And John says, greater is he 
that is in you than he that is in the world. Did I hear you uh, start to say something, Sue? It's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, feel free to, to give, give input as oh, we go uh, Okay, I, I, what I thought to say was uh, it's interesting that uh, Seymour is, is, is uh, almost worshipped by many as the great leader of the Azusa Street Revival. How many have actually heard what you're telling us about Lucy, who was in fact Seymour's pastor? Yeah. How, how you know she has been being written out of history. Right, right, true. So she is one of the women that we're actually writing back into history. That's yeah, what absolutely. I wanted to say. Yeah. Go for it, Eddie. Uh, Lu Lucy is like Luke twelve twenty seven, where Jesus said, "Consider the lilies, how they grow." Now, one thing about the Middle Eastern lilies, the wild lilies of the Middle East, they're very beautiful, but they're not hot house plants. They grow in very rough and rugged terrain, and they can survive all kinds of atmosp atmospheres. They heat and the cold. <laughs> and, 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 and Lucy Farrow was not a hothouse plant. And you are not a hothouse plant. You don't need a, a, a controlled, protected environment to become all God wants you to be. That's what Isaiah was talking about in one of his prophecies of the Messiah, where he described the Messiah as a root out of dry ground. In other words, there's, there's nothing in the surrounding environment to cause him to be whom he would become. It would be because of the internal life and the resurrection life that would cause the Messiah to become who he would become. And I want you to know you have that same life in you. So, so you too are a root out of dry ground. Lucy Farrow was a root out of dry ground. She came forth not because she had a nice cozy environment. It was because she became totally dependent upon that inner life of the Holy Spirit. And she learned to walk in the Spirit and to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And that is the key in all of our lives. It's not our outward circumstances that should dictate our lives. It should be that internal life of the Holy Spirit. And our, our total trust and our developing of a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and being led by Him in all areas of our life. Somewhere along the way, Lucy Farrow came to know Christ. And somewhere along the way, she wound up in Houston, Texas, pastoring a small holiness, black holiness church in Houston. Now, the holiness revival was a revival that emphasized John Wesley's doctrine. It was an offshoot of the early Methodist revival, which was a powerful revival throughout the United Kingdom that also came to America, had a powerful impact in America and, and, and impacted all races of people. And one thing that was unique about the Wesleyan revival and the holiness revival that, uh, and those terms can be interchangeable, the Wesleyan revival, the holiness revival of the 19th century of the 1800s, a unique thing about their doctrine, they, teach, they taught a doctrine of sanctification, a doctrine of cleansing. That's what sanctification refers to. It refers to a cleansing. It can also re refer to a, a, a special setting apart for a special purpose. But the Wesleyans and the people of the Holiness Revival, they taught what they call a second blessing, that there was a second blessing of sanctification, of cleansing, where the, the, the Holy Spirit would do this powerful work in a person's heart and would give them the power to live an overcoming life. And so Lucy Farah obviously had become a part of this great holiness revival of the 19th century. And here in the early part of the 20th century, she winds up in Houston, Texas, and she becomes the pastor of a black holiness congregation in Houston. One of her parishioners is a black man by the name of William J. Seymour. <laughs> he is a member of her congregation. In 1905, Charles Parham from Kansas came to Houston. He rented a large hall called Bryan Hall. And Charles Parham had been the, 
the director, the overseer, whatever name uh, uh, you want to call him, but he had been the director and the founder of Bethel Bible School in Topeka, Kansas. And in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, on January 1st, 1901, he and his students had been seeking God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and virtually everyone in the school uh, had an experience of speaking in tongues. And so there were some real hardships after this and opposition, but Parham continued to preach this baptism in the Holy Spirit, he called it, with what he called the Bible evidence of speaking in tongues. He believed that it was the, the, the biblical norm for people who had this experience of a spirit baptism to speak in tongues. He came to Houston, Texas. He also emphasized divine healing. He came to Houston, Texas, had a, there, there was a real miraculous healing that took place in Houston, Texas of the wife of a well-known lawyer and it brought the crowds out. And he was also preaching about this baptism in the Holy Spirit. Lucy Farrell came out to the meeting and somehow she connected with the Parms and they obviously were very impressed with her because they invited her to return with them when the meeting was over and they went back to Kansas. So Lucy Farrell turned her congregation over to William Seymour and she traveled back to Kansas City with the Parms and stayed with them in their home and while she was there, she experienced this baptism in the Holy Spirit and she spoke in other tongues like they did in Acts 2, 4 on the day of Pentecost. Well, after a few months, they all returned back to Houston, the Parms, Lucy Farrell with them, and he decided to start a Bible school. Lucy Farrell reconnected with her church and she encouraged William Seymour to attend this Bible school because she wanted him to learn about this baptism in the Holy Spirit. So he enrolled in the Bible school and Lucy Farrell, showing the humble servant heart, volunteered to be the cook for the Bible school. <laughs> Seymour was in that school it's, it's, there's, there's different ideas about it, but most likely probably around six weeks. And he received a letter from Los Angeles asking him to come to Los Angeles and pastor another holiness church in Los Angeles. It was a, a, a primarily a black holiness church. He prayed over the letter and decided God wanted him to go. So, uh, Parham took up a collection for him uh, in the school and they gave him an offering and he got a ticket and he headed out for Los Angeles. Well, he arrived, he found the church and the very first sermon he decided to preach on this baptism in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues even though he himself had never experienced it but he believed it was true and so he decided he was going to preach it. And so that raises the question, can you preach about something you haven't experienced? Well, if it is true, you can. If it is biblical truth, yes, go ahead and preach it. And like Peter Bowler, a Moravian, said to John Wesley when John Wesley was struggling about faith, and struggling whether he really had the real biblical faith for salvation. And he asked this Moravian, Peter Bowler, he said, can, can I preach faith even though I do not have the faith yet? And Peter Bowler said, preach faith until you get faith, and then preach faith because you have faith. I love that, don't you? Preach faith until you get faith, and then preach faith because you have faith. Well, William Seymour made a commitment. He was going to preach this message even though he hadn't experienced it. He was going to preach it because he was convinced it was true. And so his first message in Los Angeles, in this church, this, this holiness church that believed in a second experience of sanctification, which they believed was a work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. 
William Seymour took his text from Acts chapter 2, verse 16 where on the day of Pentecost when they were all speaking in tongues and some were saying that they were drunk and, and, and some said, well, what does this mean? And Peter stood up and said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So Peter tied what was happening on the day of Pentecost that they were asking about this speaking in tongues, Peter tied it to the prophecy of Joel in chapter 2 of Joel's prophecy where Joel said it shall come to pass afterward. Peter added the words in the last days that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So here's how William Seymour presented this message about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to this New congregation that he has just met, his first sermon. He pointed out that Peter said this that you see happening on the day of Pentecost, the speaking in tongues, is that which Joel prophesied about, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Seymour said, so if you don't have this, the speaking in tongues, you don't have that, the Holy Spirit that Joel spoke about. Why? Because Peter said this is that, so if you don't have this, you don't have that. <laughs> no, the, Holy Spirit. the Holy Spirit is present at regeneration. Oh, absolutely. But, but what, I'm, he's I'm, saying I'm is, what he's saying is that you don't have the baptism, the fullness that is available to you. Yes, and, and I am merely presenting to you what, how William Seymour preached his first sermon. And there's a whole lot more we could say about the Holy Spirit. So no, I do not believe that the Holy Spirit is tied to speaking in tongues. But this in his simple way, this is how William Seymour was presenting his understanding of speaking in tongues but, and the Holy Eddie, Spirit. But Eddie, you do believe that the Holy Spirit is tied to speaking in tongues. You don't really mean what you just said. I believe that the Holy Spirit works in ways when, when the tongues are not there. Yes, I believe speaking in tongues is an expression of the Holy Spirit. Yes. A manifestation. A manifestation of the Spirit. What I'm saying is just because somebody speaks in tongues, that doesn't mean that in and of itself that they have the Holy Spirit. Because, you better get on to Lucy Farrell because yeah, that's what yeah, this yeah. lesson's <laughs> about and we're getting, we're getting down on time. So this, this is the, how Seymour presented his sermon. When he came back for the evening service, he found the, pa the door padlocked because the elders decided he was preaching heresy. A couple of the members felt sorry for him and they invited him to go to their home to stay. They noticed that Seymour was spending a lot of time in prayer. And so they invited him to go to another home on Asbury Street where they were having a prayer meeting. And so let me just go here to where this is in this situation. Just bear with me because I, I want to get the people's name where he was staying on Bonnie Bray Street or where he was the prayer meeting. It was in the Asbury home. They were having a prayer meeting in their home and it became a nightly prayer meeting and so Seymour was staying in the home of Edward Lee and his wife and they would go to the prayer meeting on Bonnie Bray Street and William Seymour was a leader he was a preacher so they quickly they began to look to him as their leader and he began to share with them what he knew and what he had learned he also shared with them about this woman, his former pastor, Lucy Farrell, and how she had received this experience he was telling them about. Their hearts were stirred with hunger, so much so that they took up a collection and they asked Seymour to buy a ticket and send it to Lucy Farrell and ask her to come to Los Angeles. So they did that. 
They bought a ticket. They sent it to her and asked her to please come to Los Angeles, that there were some very hungry people there. So Lucy Fair received their letter, the ticket. She prayed over it, and she decided that she wouldn't send the ticket back, that she would go. So she arrived, and they'd given her directions to the Edward Lee home where she would be staying. And when she arrived there, she arrived early, and Mrs. Lee was there. Edward Lee was the uh, custodian of one of the big banks in downtown Los Angeles. Well, when he came home, he was so hungry for this baptism in the Holy Spirit that William Seymour had been telling them about and, and had been telling them about Lucy Farrell and how she had this experience and how the blessing of God was upon her. And when... After a brief introduction, Edward Lee immediately said to Lucy Farrell, Sister, please lay your hands upon me so that I might receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. Lucy Farrell responded in a way that is very telling about her walk with the Lord. She said to him, I can't do it unless the Holy Spirit tells me. Wow. So she did not have an assembly line approach, praying with people. Probably out of great challenges in life and and facing great ordeals, she had developed a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and had learned the importance of listening to the Holy Spirit and following that still small voice and following His guidance. And oh, how we all need to develop that sensitivity to that still small voice because the Holy Spirit does not always speak like thunder from heaven and flashing neon signs. Very often the Holy Spirit speaks in what in the Old Testament was called a still small voice, a slight nudge. But oh, when we develop that sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and we respond to His slightest nudges, incredible things will happen. And this is a key to the story of Lucy Farrell. Eddie, let's just put the pause button there for a minute. Could we just talk a little bit about this this whole approach? Yes. And you need to help me with this, okay? okay? Can we have a conversation about this? Sure, yes, Sue, yes. Thank you for, for sharing your thoughts here. You know, it is a tradition in much of charismatic and Pentecostal meetings and prophecy group meetings that you just um, you just line up and it happens. Mm. You know, the, the person who's right. in the, the teacher's chair, the prophet's chair, whatever it is, they're just supposed to hit push a button, bing, 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 go down the line, pray. Mm-hmm. You know, I have never been free in my spirit to do that. Mm -hmm. I remember we were in one meeting here in Dallas and I I got another thought going through my mind and I want to bring this up because this came to me this afternoon to share too. Um, But we were in this meeting and there, we were in this meeting and people went forward for prayer and the pastors and, and other preacher leaders who were there were to form uh, like lines on either side of the people who wanted prayer. And, and the ushers were pushing these people through like and, cattle. And pulling them, you know. Pulling like just, them. just as though they were cattle. And I thought, oh God, this must grieve you so much because it sure does me to see people being treated like this, to see that people are so hungry that they don't understand that they have direct communication with you, God, that they have to come forward for prayer and have a mediator stand between them and you, and then to be treated in this terrible way of being pushed and pulled through this line like like cattle. I thought this is terrible, but that's an extreme case Mm. that I wanted to bring to light because I know when the Holy Spirit is telling me to pray for somebody. Yes. And I'm more than willing to just whatever. But when the Holy Spirit is not leading, I am not inclined 
to just do the routine ritual. And that's what it is. It's a ritual. It's mm -hmm. a religious ritual that has yeah. developed where you just line up and you, you know, you either prophesy in the soul to them out of the soul realm or else you, you, you know, you, you pray for them. And in many cases, maybe something happens per chance. But, 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 but I'll be, tell you what, sooner or later, these people who are being treated this way are going to become disillusioned yeah. when what has been done to them does not bring the fruit of God mm. into and through their lives. Yeah. I think it's a very dangerous practice. Now, I'm boldly expressing my opinion, but this is based on many years of experience. Yeah. It's based on observation, it's based on study, mm -hmm. and it's based on something that God himself spoke to me in a powerful encounter when we were in a class on missions. Everybody wanted to pray, I lay my head on the table because I really didn't have any motivation to quote unquote ritualistically pray. Because I believe prayer is that communication with God because we are vines, we are the, the, the branches in the vine and we're hooked into him and we flow, the life of God flows in us and through us. That's what I see in scripture. Mm. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit, when I was at rest saying, you know, let them pray God, whatever, you know, God have mercy on me because I know I need it. But I want to know his ways. I don't want to become an echo of somebody. I don't want to become yes. um, a, a copy mm -hmm. of somebody else. I don't want to sound like somebody mm -hmm. else. I want to be who God created me to be. And I want to help other people, men and women, be just exactly who God wants them to be. And he never creates copies. Yeah. He always True. creates originals. Yeah. Amen. So what he was saying to me in this incredible encounter when he hit me like a bolt of lightning was, I want to purge the message mm -hmm. that the church is taking. I want to purge the message. I want to clean it up. I want it to be my message that the church is announcing, that the church is carrying around the world. It's like, yes, sir. And I'm willing however you want to use me to do that, I'm willing. So help me to walk this out, Lord. Help me to understand and not assume or presume anything, but just yes. daily to walk yeah. this out. And I know that's your heart as sure. well, Eddie. Yes. Amen. Too. Okay. So in Lucy Pharaoh, we yeah. see something similar. I see something similar oh, yeah. to what I personally believe. And that is wait on the Lord and walk out what he's saying. Don't take things out of God's hands. I once heard an incredible uh, musician say something that I, I've never forgotten. She said, I'll play the organ and we'll sing great songs even though the spirit isn't moving because we'll get the spirit moving by doing this. Oh, it's like, yeah, okay, but wow, shouldn't we be careful about taking things out of God's hands and pumping people up in the soul realm? Mm -hmm. When yeah. what we need is the spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We don't need more soul realm stuff. Right. Amen. We better not, if we want to be powerhouses for God, we better be spirit filled. We better be spirit led for as many as are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. I mean, Eddie, yeah. let's make some adjustments Amen. here. Let's help people yes. to Amen. see some of these things yeah. that Amen. we have learned through these years. Mm -hmm. And here's an example in this woman who's been written out of history, this Lucy Farrow, mm -hmm. who was a humble, holiness, black, born in slavery, woman of God who knew him and who walked by the Spirit. You can bet she was filled with God's peace not mm. only peace but power yeah and so when this mr lee said oh pray for me i want what you have it's like she said well god has not told she said i me. cannot do it unless the lord says so wow i cannot do it unless the lord says so sila <laughs> sila okay yeah i'm not going to be legalistic about it but there's a point to be made here yeah 
Okay, Eddie, I had my say. Go for it. So shortly afterwards, so when he, he wanted her to immediately lay hands on him for, so he could receive this experience. She said, she said, I cannot do it unless the Lord says so. So they went on a little bit later. They sat down for the evening meal. Remember, she, she has just arrived. This is her first time with this family. They're sitting at the evening meal. They're eating. And all of a sudden, Lucy Farrell, you know, the Holy Spirit can... can, can can move at the most interesting times, unexpected times. In the middle of their evening meal, suddenly Lucy Farrell lays down her fork. She pushes back her chair and she gets up and she walks around to Edward Lee and said, the Lord tells me to lay my hands on you for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and she laid her hands on him. The power of God hit him. He fell out of his chair in the kitchen floor lying there as like he was just totally knocked out and then all of a sudden he breaks out worshiping God in other tongues. And it was like the presence and the glory of God filled that kitchen. Well, after a while he was able to get up off of the floor. They finished their meal and then they departed for the prayer meeting on Bonnie Bray Street at the, the Asbury home. When they arrived there, there were already a number of people there, and Edward Lee is still overflowing with this experience. And he walks through the door and he lifts his hand and begins to speak in tongues. And the Holy Spirit fell upon everyone there, and many of those fell out of their seats in the floor. Many of them began to speak in other tongues. There, there were various kinds of manifestations. There was one woman there by the name of uh, Jenny Lee, I believe was her name. She later became the wife of William Seymour. She had no training, no experience in music of any kind. And when all of this is happening, <laughs> she suddenly rises and there's a piano in the room. She goes over and she sits down and she begins to play beautifully on the piano and to sing. And so it was an incredible thing. It was shortly after that, this house filled with people and the crowds began to come and spread out on the lawn and uh, in the yard. And this is a residential area. According to one account, there were so many people crowded into the house that the floor gave way. And so they realized they were going to have to find another place for their prayer meeting. And so they looked around and they found an old building that had once been an African-American Episcopal church, but they had moved to a new building and an individual, a builder, had bought this old building and he was using it to, 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 score, to store scrap lumber and it even kept a horse in it, used it as a stable. Well, they found this. They were able to rent it for $50 a month and they, they cleaned out the bottom floor. It was a two-story two building. And they set up some rough wooden benches. They made a pulpit in the middle of the floor out of wooden shoe boxes and they opened up... Uh, 312 Azusa Street for their prayer meeting. I believe it was on April 16th, 1906. They moved their prayer meeting there. Lucy Farrell continued there for about four months. Seymour looked up to her. She had been his pastor. She was about 10 years his senior. And remember, he talked about her. It was from him talking about Lucy Farrell and the anointing of God upon her life that stirred the people there to take up an offering to send for her to come there. She stayed there for four months. It was obvious that there was a particular gift of God upon her to lay her hands upon people to receive this baptism in the Holy Spirit. After about four months, she felt a call to Africa she felt a call to go back to Liberia from which her ancestors had been brought to America as slaves. And so she left Los Angeles and on her way she was going to travel back to Virginia, her home state. From there she was going to go to New York and she was going to ca uh, catch a ship to Africa, to Liberia. On her way to Virginia she stopped in Houston and she reconnected with Charles Parham 
who was having a count meeting in Houston, Texas. Now here is something very amazing. And this shows the, the, the power of how God can open doors, unusual doors in any kind of situation. If you are totally, if your life is in Him, you're following Him, and you are not reacting to circumstances around you, but you are proactive and you are responding to the Holy Spirit, God can open incredible doors. And so she stopped in Houston, Texas, and the unheard of happened. Parm was having a camp meeting in the Houston area with hundreds, maybe thousands of people in attendance. And it would have been a white camp meeting in, in, in South Houston in the time of Jim Crow laws and segregation. But there was, there was such the favor of God upon Lucy Farrell that Parham asked her to address and to preach <laughs> at this camp meeting. But Parham wasn't, uh, ra he had, didn't have a racial bone in his body. And so she preached and something powerful happened and she told about the revival that was happening in Azusa Street. And at the end of her message, people began to flock to the front wanting this black woman to lay her hands on them because they wanted this experience. There was a young man there, 24 years old, by the name of Howard Goss. He later became a very prominent leader in the Pentecostal movement and actually became the first general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Churches years later in the 1940s. But he was 24 years old at the time. And he tells about listening to this black woman that there was such a deep hunger that was stirred in his heart. So when the opportunity was there, he said, So I went forward that she might place her hands upon me. When she did, the Spirit of God struck me like a bolt of lightning. The power of God surged through my body, and I began speaking in other tongues. Wow an early Pentecostal leader, that was his experience. Years later, Howard Goss was writing about this experience. And he said of Lucy Farrell that she seemed to have a very unusual, or here's how he said, I have the direct quote. He said, she had an amazing gift for laying hands on people and them receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so here she had a powerful impact on future leaders of the Pentecostal movement. My friends, again, don't react. Don't be a, a captive to what's happening in the world. Be a soldier of Jesus Christ. Be proactive. Preach Jesus. Preach His Word. God will put you in the most unusual places to reach people that otherwise you could never reach, you could never touch. She went on from Texas, went to back to Virginia, and she began to hold some meetings in Portsmouth, Virginia. Very powerful meetings, outpouring of the Holy Spirit that lasted several weeks. It was reported that about 200 people came to Christ in these meetings, and at least 150 were baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. She's feeling this urge to get to Africa. But there was such a powerful work of the Holy Spirit, so many people coming to the Lord that she didn't feel right about just going off and leaving it. So she contacted Seymour back in Los Angeles and she asked him to send a reliable person to come there who would continue the work in Portsmouth, Virginia so she could continue on in her mission. And so the Azusa Street Mission did send a person. I don't have the person's name. I don't know if anyone has ever found it. But they sent a person there. And when this person arrived, Lucy Farrell turned the work in Portsmouth, Virginia over to this person. And she continued on uh, to New York. She bought a ticket. And she sailed for Africa. If I'm not mistaken, she was the first 
Pentecostal missionary to go to Africa. I think she not? may well have been, Sue, because I read that this somewhere is years very ago. early. This is 1907. Yeah, I read that years ago. No, yeah. I've heard that some other woman was the first, but I really think Lucy Farrow was the first Pentecostal missionary to Africa. Wow. Well, I believe that. I, I, I mean, it's just... How dare we write her out of history? Yeah, how, how dare Isn't she be that, written out of history? Oh, dear. Okay. She Eddie. got to Africa, went to Monrovia, the capital, and finally settled in the town of, I, I believe it, it was called Johnstown. And I, yeah, Johnsville. Johnsville, about 25 miles from Monrovia. Where she, and from, from, from Johns, Johnsonville, she carried on a ministry of preaching, teaching, praying for the sick, <laughs> and leading people into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She continued there in Africa for some time. And then eventually she felt that her work was done and that God was calling her back to America. And so she came back to America. Now remember, she was, she was born in 1951. So when she... I'm sorry, 1851. So when she went to Africa uh, in 1907, she would have been close to 60. And so she is getting on up in years. So she, 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 the lifespan was not as, as long that time back then, Sue, as it is today. The lifespan was shorter, uh, probably because uh, there weren't the modern uh, drugs uh, like penicillin, antibiotic drugs to deal with diseases and so on. She did die of tuberculosis in Texas. She came to Texas to live with her son. Oh, is that right? And in 1911, I believe it was, she passed away from, by, uh, from tuberculosis. Mm. For several years, looking. though, she, she lived in uh, Los Angeles right behind the Azusa Street mission and what uh, the Azusa Street papers, I, I have here the Azusa Street papers that were uh, published between 1906 and 1908. And, and this is mentioned in the Azusa Street papers, and I believe in, the 19, in a 1908 edition, um, that she was there in this, lived in this, what they call a small faith cottage located behind the Azusa Street mi mission. And according to uh, the report, many people were visiting her there to receive of her wisdom and her prayers. And many people testified of being healed, of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this is the report I'm quoting from, from uh, the, the uh, Apostolic Hold Faith. Hold it up so people can see it, Eddie. The Azusa Street Papers. Actually, that is the cover that was created for this edition. <laughs> This is the first one. This is a, the paper that was published by the Azusa Street Mission. And this is the first one, September 1906. And the headline says, Pentecost has come. And the, the uh, subtitle is, Los Angeles being visited by a revival of Bible salvation and Pentecost as recorded in the book of Acts. And who was it that ignited this revival? It was a black woman by the name of Lucy Farrell who had been William Seymour's pastor and was 10 years his senior and a, a, a person that he looked up to. Oh, Eddie, I wonder how many people have heard that. Even, even people who've studied in seminary about the Azusa Street Revival. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many know the story of Lucy and how she was the person that God used to ignite the revival. Yeah, not, not I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's talked about that much. Here's too. something too that I want to say, and you will remember this. In 1984, the fall, when we came back to Texas after mm -hmm. being in Canada for eight years, yeah. we attended a quite an astounding revival here in the Metroplex. Mm -hmm. And God bless Norval Hayes, what a great guy. He was preaching, and there was a revival that broke out, and it was sort of like Norval's revival. But what's the truth behind that, Eddie? Well, Give us the know truth. It started in the Bible school with a woman, and we may have to get Valerie to come over and tell this. Valerie Owen 
was waiting to teach and, and it was being broadcast by satellite. We had, we, it was after we had moved back here so we weren't having it, but uh, it was being broadcast by satellite. And Valerie was, was sitting, I think she might have been kneeling, and she was just talking to God and praying. Getting ready to, while, to while teach Bill her Kaiser class. While Bill Kaiser was leading praise and worship. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came upon her and she became suspended. She couldn't move. <laughs> like Maria Woodworth uh -huh. Edder. We and she was done. seeing the clock. And the clock was getting up to where she was going to have to go and teach. And she tells about how she said, God, God, I've got to go teach. <laughs> but she was, it was like she was, was locked. She was suspended. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit fell. And, 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 and not through this stream, and the phones begin to ring off the hook there. This is while Valerie is in the suspended state worshiping the Lord. Yeah. And talking to the Lord about, you know, it's time for me to teach, Lord. You know what time it is. And yet, here's what's happening while she's in this state. Uh, uh, the suspended state. The phones start to ring from all over the world. And so we may have to get Valerie. Valerie's on tonight out there. Valerie, would you come over sometime and, and let's talk about that. But here's the thing. That, see, God used Valerie to ignite a powerful revival that was later quenched by human mistakes. Okay? Mm -hmm. But God used a woman again to ignite a powerful revival that was then attributed to a celebrity male, mm. okay? In right. other words, we have a personal, up-close example of a woman who was written out of history right. in relation to a very important event mm -hmm. that, that Bill Kaiser leading in worship, Valerie becomes suspended in the spirit as she's worshiping, and the Holy Spirit fills that Bible school and spills over into the evening revival services. But God used Valerie to ignite that revival just in the same way that he used uh, Lucy, Pharaoh, to ignite the Azusa Street revival, right. you see? Yes. And, and I know there are other examples. For, uh, give me, I'll give you one more. I was amazed when I was studying um, the charismatic renewal, Eddie. Mm -hmm. Do you know who the woman was that God used to ignite the revival? Jean uh, Stone. Okay. Ever heard of Jean Stone? Uh, yes, I have. I think well, she's a you're one of, of the few. Romas. You're one of the few. You see, because other celebrities were given preeminence, and Jean Stone was written out. Mm. And I, I remember being in class this day, and I heard this, and I. I lost it. I said, another woman. God used another woman. You see, as I was studying in, at ORU in this uh, particular degree, I was, I was, through research and through lectures, I was hearing about all of these women that God had used that I knew nothing about. And even today, most people don't know about them because they continue to be put on the shelf instead of being given their rightful place alongside, mm -hmm. not above men, right. but alongside of men mm -hmm. that God used. Right. How many times have women been mm. pushed aside, women that God has used? And we've got to write these women back into history and receive the inspiration that they can give. And Eddie, you had an article published by Charisma this week yeah. that was not written for Charisma at all. It right. was written about this very issue that we must write God's women mm -hmm. back into history. Could you deviate for just a moment and give us, give us a good strong punch about that? Because that's the reason God has called, one of the main reasons God has called forth this International Christian Women's mm. Hall of Fame and Ministry Center. Well, I, I was really moved in my heart to write up why this ministry, this International Christian Women's Hall of Fame, is vitally important in the plan and purpose of God. And so I wrote it up and I talked about how young women today have been robbed of, of the examples, the role models and examples of women like Lucy Farrell, women like 
Phoebe Palmer, women like uh, 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 Catherine Booth, women like Amanda Berry Smith, uh, that young women today have been robbed of, of these examples. And this has weakened the church and, and how it is so important that these women be written back into history. And so I wrote it up mostly for our mailing list and for our social networks and Facebook. But I went ahead and at the end, so this is what's interesting, at the end I gave an invitation for people to partner with this in prayer and in financial giving, invited people to give and, and, uh, put, it, uh, and, and put the link to the website. And so I went ahead and I sent it to the editor at uh, Charisma. And, uh, you know, I thought they might, pu might, they might uh, publish it, but I figured they'd take off the stuff well, about I had recommended, inviting people to be, be yeah, a part. I had recommended that you take that part off, but you left it on but no I problem. Left it. So, so anyway, I was, I was very ple pleasantly surprised. When they I wasn't looking on. for it. But I noticed that they had published in the online Christian magazine. Oh, God is at work. God is at work. They had published it just as is. Awesome. God is at and work. And so God is, is, God is promoting you know, this ministry. He's getting the word out there about this International Christian Women's Hall of Fame and why it is here. This is, this is, this is God's Kairos time for this, Eddie. It is. Sue. Here's it is. something Eileen Kenny wrote. Your comments are right on target, Sue. I've been herded through prayer lines and just left feeling hurt and discouraged. There are lots of rituals, even in Pentecostal, charismatic, and I would say prophetic churches. So good to see the women being written back into church history, too. Eileen. Thanks, Eileen. Yeah. Paul and Eileen, thank you all for being such a blessing to the body of Christ and to us and to this ministry. And, and Tara Chambers says, write them back into history. Help us, Tara. You help write them. Talk to me about it. Now, now she so says to inspire us to create more history. That's right. Be a history maker. Uh, so we should mention that our friend Estrella Alexander has written a book called The Women of Azusa Street. And I would love for her to come and teach an entire course and, on and, that. And she would have a write-up about uh, she would. Uh, Lucy Farrell. You know, Eddie, back many, many years ago, I've lost track. It must be 20, it must be almost 18 years ago, Estrelda came to, you, to, to Grapevine and Euless, where we were living at the time. That's right, she did. Yes, she did. So she knows where we are. She came and she said, Sue and Eddie, what is it that you have in mind to do? At that time, we could not give her the vision that we now have. And she uh, later had me speak at a conference she hosted at Lee University. Now, since then, we've kind of drifted apart. She's done a number of things, including teaching at Regent University School of Divinity. But I think she has started her own school. But she has written on the women of Azusa Street. Yeah, and it's my intention her. to say, Estrelda, will you, Dr. Alexander, will you please come and teach that course? And we could invite people in. And let's do it. Let's do it. So, in closing, let, let me s say this again, and I also want to mention the things, just reiterate the things that we can learn. Lucy Farrell was William J. Seymour's pastor. She was ten, about 10 years his senior, and obviously a woman that he looked up to. And in Los Angeles, when he wasn't seeing a breakthrough, he was telling people about her. because she, Why was he talking about her? Because she had been such an inspiration in his life. And so he sent, he and, and the people there, they sent for Lucy Farrow, bought her a train ticket and asked her, pleaded with her to come to Los Angeles. And it was only after that Lucy Farrow arrived in Los Angeles and, and by the leading of the Holy Spirit began to pr lay her hands on people and pray with them that the Azusa Street Revival was ignited. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then from there, the revival spread all over the world. And so what can we learn from Lucy Farrell? Well, we can learn that no matter your circumstances, no matter the family you were born in, no matter your circumstances that you are in right now, you can be a victor. Determine now 
that you are going to develop a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Just focus on your gift. Don't try to be like anybody else. Just focus on your gift. Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Be sensitive to his leading. Yes, but, and, and what I mean by that, Sue, focus on your gift. Don't try to be all things to everybody. Just flow in the gift that he has given you. Learn to be led by the Spirit. And trust God to open the doors. And as you focus on your gift and just exercise the gift that He has given you, doors will open beyond anything that you could ever have expected. Now, let's pray. Lucy Farrell helped ignite a great revival. That entire congregation there, we could say, in a sense, was baptized, soaked, immersed in the Holy Spirit. People might wonder why uh, there is no picture of her tonight, and the, the reality is there might be one somewhere, but no I have one never, has... I have never no, found it. No, interesting. I have searched, and even uh, the parents, through the entry in the, uh, what, what's the real large, the, the dictionary? Yeah, which the is, Pentecostal Charismatic uh, Dictionary. Uh, even it does not have one of her. I wonder, so, I, I wonder if the Parham's, uh, Bobby Parham uh, would have, the Parham files might possibly have a picture because she lived with the Parhams for a while. Well, you know, we went through those files and I don't remember seeing one. You know, back then I was not aware of you how... You wasn't aware to look for it. I, I was not aware of how strategic Lucy Farrow was because everything was say more, say more, say more. And, and Lucy was somewhere right. lost in the shadows. Yes. So yeah, we're true. now writing her back. But perhaps someone will be inspired to paint a portrait of Lucy well, Farrell but not for a, the but, Hall of Fame. Yes, but it has to be a legitimate portrait, not an imaginary one, Eddie. You know what I mean? We can't just make up a picture of Lucy. Well, based on you what know, we know of her. I wish I could remember who her uncle was. Oh, it the, was Frederick Douglass. Frederick the, Douglass. The, the famous abolitionist. Was, was Lucy's uncle. Was Lucy's uncle, yeah. Very talented, intelligent, articulate, articulate leaders of, at a critical time in history. Wow. So this baptism, Lucy Farrow was all about this promise of the Father. This baptism, this soaking in the Holy Spirit. And you know, when the Holy Spirit comes and there is this baptism in the Holy Spirit, our, our, our senses are lifted and heightened in every way. And that is what the church needs today. And we all, we desire, we want a fresh infusion, outpouring, fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit. So in closing tonight, I want to, I, I, if, if you realize that this is really what the church needs today. And I find that in the book of Acts, the same people who were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, they are filled again in Acts 4 as they're gathered together praying. And it says the place where they were shaken was, the place where they were praying was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God with boldness. These are the same people in Acts 2. So there can be these, these continuous fillings, baptisms, manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Folks, this is what the churches, it, the churches need today. Not a new program. Not another program. We need a fresh baptism Not a method. of the Holy Spirit. Not another Not method. Not another method. Not a new order. No but a fresh baptism of God's Holy Spirit. Let's pray that for ourselves right now. Ask in faith. A wonderful promise in Luke, I think it's chapter 13. Jesus was talking about prayer. And he said, which is of you is a parent? If a child asks you for an egg, would you give him a stone? If he asks for bread, would you give him a stone? If he, if, if he asks for... Um, an egg, would you give him a scorpion? Of course, no decent parent would even consider that. 
And then Jesus said, If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Remember, Jesus called it the promise of the Father. And here He says, How much more will the, will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Would you agree together with me and let's, let's pray and let's ask God for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon this ministry, upon this International Christian Women's Hall of Fame that it is right now coming forth. Oh, we want it to come forth and go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe it has to this point, but we want it to continue and to increase and to grow. I want to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on, on your life, all of our lives, on any churches you are connected with and on the body of Christ in general. Lord, we're inspired tonight talking about this woman of history. Lord, she knew about that promise of the Father. And Lord, much of your church today doesn't know about it. And if they do know about it, they've neglected it for other things, for programs, for entertainment. But Lord, we realize tonight that what Lucy Farrell preached and taught is what your people, your body is needing today. So Lord, we ask you, and based on your promise, you said how much more will the, <laughs> the Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask Him? Lord, we pray for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon everyone watching this stream and everyone watching this video. We pray, Lord, for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We pray for a fresh outpouring upon the body of Christ. Lord, not just an emotional high, but a true, genuine outpouring of your Spirit on your people everywhere. We ask it, O Lord, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, one of the songs that Lucy Farrell well, you're doing would that. have sung... Well, because it was a common song at Azusa Street. Yeah, well, you're getting your guitar there, Eddie. I just want to thank um, two things. I want to thank Shirley Hall from New Zealand for just sending along $50 for the hall. Oh, good. thank you, So Shirley. thankful. And uh, it's interesting that Priscilla, I uh, asked her where she's from, and she's watching from Taiwan. Wow, Taiwan. Yes. Well, Priscilla, I think you're the first person that we have had on, as far as we know, from Taiwan. You know, Linda Miller did a wonderful presentation on a missionary to Taiwan. I wish I could remember her name, but we will be bringing her forward again, too. Yeah. Did a, a great work in Taiwan. Right. Okay, Eddie, you've got a song, and let's uh, bring her to a close soon. This is a common song that Lucy Farrell would have sung. It was a common song, I understood. I understand sung at, at the Azusa Street Mission. Says the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round. Wherever folks are found That the Comforter has come I want to read uh, from Valerie's book, Isaiah 52, 9. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. Yes. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. For as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. Yes, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round. Wherever folks are found That the Comforter has come 
Yes, He has been given. He is here. Open your heart to receive Him right now. Open your heart. If you haven't told God that you want Him, you want the Holy Spirit, you want to be filled, you want to be baptized, you want to be soaked in His presence, you want to be that baptism in the Holy Spirit. He's here. Receive it now in the name of Jesus. Yes, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round. Wherever folks are found. That the comforter has come. There's and Priscilla, is it okay? I just feel, Priscilla, that I'd like to pray for you. And pray for you for God's guidance in your life. And that you will see clearly the vision that He has for you. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask you to touch Priscilla in Taiwan right now. God, guide her steps as you have promised and help her, Lord, to see clearly the vision and the plan that you have for her. And Lord, may it unfold before her very eyes, we pray. And we thank you for it. And we believe it will happen because the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, it's here, has come. And we thank you for that, O oh God, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Well, Sue, I'm going to open up. Have you been to uh, live stream? Yeah, I'm, I've been following both, Eddie. Okay, um, that's good. Okay, if you want to go there, that's fine. <coughs> um, the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. I know there are those who need this, this idea, this fact that the Holy Spirit will comfort you. Romans 15, 4. Comfort, let's see, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning. I guess I should have a double screen up here, shouldn't I? Were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort mm. of the scriptures might have hope. Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Psalm 71, 21, write it down. God says he will comfort you on every side. Psalm, uh, Isaiah 61, 2, God will comfort all who mourn. Mm, Psalm yes. 119, 50, this is my comfort in my affliction for your word has given me life. Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort according to your word to your servant. Psalm 119.76. And, and Sue, uh, you read the, the really good uh, response from uh, Eileen Kenny about what you were saying about right. the assembly line. There was a good comment also by Laura yes. up to Grove up in uh, Springdale, Arkansas. She said, yes. I so agree, Sue, about the assembly line effect. I have been in those meetings in the past, the Lord really let me know I am to stay away from that. I am afraid the creating of sensationalism generates more money for those churches, but it is really a lot of flesh and emotion. Ma yes. Matthew 9.22. Write that down. Matthew yes. 9.22. But Jesus turned him about. I'm not sure why him is capitalized there. And when he saw her, he said, and Jesus turned about, I think that's what it means. And when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. In Jesus' name, be comforted, be whole. And, and, and you know, here's a prayer. And, and this is based on Lucy Farrow too, Sue. Here's a prayer, uh, Psalm 67 1 and 2 has been very much a part of our lives since the year we were first married and and we we have put that everywhere god be merciful unto us and bless us because we know we need his mercy and bless us because if he doesn't we have nothing to give but just in the past few months i have 
been using that not just as a declaration but as a prayer God have mercy upon me and bless me out of your mercy bless me bless me in ways I don't deserve out you, you know the word mercy my definition is it's an undeserved act of kindness and the Bible says that God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting Paul says that he is rich in mercy and so that that prayer of Psalm 67 1 and 2 oh God have mercy and out of your mercy bless me and cause your face to shine upon me God's face shining upon us is his divine favor it's his favor shining through us and 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 I can't help but think that that is what Lucy Farrell experienced how else could she a black woman be asked to preach to a white camp meeting in South Texas and the people flocking and saying please lay your hands upon me there was a divine favor that was upon her that transcended everything else and and caused caused her to be desired you know in places where she normally would not be and I want to pray that for you for somebody out there that's struggling in your purpose in life maybe in your ministry in your calling you know what you need is God's divine favor God's divine favor will open doors <laughs> yes God's divine favor will open doors that have been shut to you and so in the name of Jesus and you see we have to approach it humbly because we don't deserve his blessing we don't des in, in ourselves we don't deserve his favor but the prayer of Psalm 67 1 and 2 is oh God have mercy upon us have mercy upon me and out of your great mercy bless me O God and cause your face to shine upon me and God as your face shines upon me and through me I will have that divine favor and doors will open to me that would never open otherwise and I will walk in places I will walk through doors and I will go places and I will do things and I will speak to people that otherwise I would never see places I would never go and people to whom I would never speak except for your divine favor that is upon me and so I pray that right now for you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that as you humble yourself before the Lord and recognize that you need his mercy we all need his undeserved acts of kindness and God out of your great mercy grant my friend there your blessing and grant my friend your divine favor that will bring the open doors that heretofore have been closed but will bring open doors just like it did for Lucy Farrell will bring amazing open doors hallelujah and Lord it's not for us but as Psalm 67 1 and 2 goes on and says so that Lord do this bless me cause your face to shine upon me and the reason is turned outward so that your way will be known and your salvation among all nations that is why we pray and we receive God's blessing and his divine favor his face shining upon this place the International Christian Women's Hall of Fame and Ministry Center we receive God's favor why so that his way will be known on earth his salvation among all nations thank you for being with us tonight so glad to be able to share about an amazing woman in history that many people don't know about now let's go and tell people about her and by the way what I have taught tonight is in an article so it was published by Charisma magazine online I don't know maybe three or four years ago you so Sue sent it out so read that over and you also become a instrument and a channel for writing Lucy Farrell back into history and tell people her significance and her prominence in the Azusa Street Revival God bless you. We'll see you all next Tuesday night. 
Yes, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The promised Father given. Oh, spread the tidings round. Wherever folks are found. At the Comforter. 